Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And we have with us today, Clotilde Terry, who's the president of ISEV. Um, and I've just asked Clotilde to say a few words about a couple of upcoming initiatives of ISEV. So Clotilde, um, could you tell us about maybe the annual meeting and the MISEV renewal? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, so indeed, yeah, it's a great uh, uh, time to tell everyone that uh, I, I guess you are all aware of that, but there's going to be the annual meeting of ISEV at the end of May in France, and it's going to be the first time back in person after two years of this pandemic. So we are very excited about it. We, uh, we are sure that we are going to have at least, uh, well, around a thousand or something like that uh, people. So it's going to be a great, uh, a great meeting. So we hope that uh, majority of you will be able to join there. And uh, the other initiative that uh, Ken mentioned is the, um, so we are in the process of generating a renewal and update of the MISEF guideline, guidelines that you are probably all uh, also aware of, the MISEF 2018 at least. So it's going to be a MISEF 2022 or 23. And so they're really going to be like last time. Uh, we the, the process is to ask uh, for feedback from all the members. So if you are a member, you will receive an email uh, asking for uh, to take a survey to uh, indicate your uh, uh, agreement or not, or suggestion for changes in the different aspects of this uh, text on the guidelines of ISEF. So again, you need to be a member for that. And also hopefully uh, to check your, uh, your emails in case things email end up in the spam, which may happen. But so we hope that a lot of members will indeed take this survey and, and put their comments and feedback. Thank you, Ken, I give you back the floor. Thank you, Clotilde. So we're very excited about the meeting and also for this rigor initiative that ISEV is now renewing. Um, so, so everybody, if you're, if you're not an ISA member for this year, go renew your membership. You get a lot of good benefits, including access to the workshops that we hold, and we'll have some exciting workshops too to announce very soon. Um, so today we have a, an event where um, I've called it a double header because we have two talks. Uh, these are talks that are based upon papers that were recently published in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, which is one of the two journals of ISEV along with the Journal of Extracellular Biology. And so we have uh, Jakob Bota, who's um, coming to us from, from uh, Denmark today. Um, and he's gonna be giving the first talk and then we'll go to Sara Busato, who's in Boston right now. And um, she, um, she uh, also uh, Joy Wolfram is on the line from Australia. Um, so we'll be hearing today about some of the fellow travelers of EVs, the lipoproteins that many of us know and love or potentially know and hate, depending on what we like to do with them. Um, so Yako, Sarah, thank you so much for joining. And Yako, I'm gonna let you get started here. Um, and we're excited to hear about your work with lipoproteins and EVs. So thanks for the opportunity uh, for presenting uh, my work, which uh, has been published in the Journal of Exocellular Vesicles recently um, regarding lipid-based strategies uh, used to identify uh, extracellular vesicles and flow cytometry uh, and how these can be confounded by lipoproteins and specifically we looked into uh, yeah how anexin 5 and lactoterin which are both both phosphatidyl serine markers and also deter detergent lysis might be confounded on by these lipoproteins uh, so i guess most of you all know what evs are or extracellular vesicles but i'll do a brief inter introduction anyways and uh, and state why they might be important or interesting at least. So uh, EVs are um, biological nanoparticles um, that are released from all cells and they are present in most uh, biofluids. Uh, also EVs can generally be divided into three uh, different categories depending on their uh, biogenesis. So we've got exosomes which are produced uh, in uh, endosomes inside of the cell, we've got microvesicles, which are released from the plasma membrane, and then we've got apoptotic bodies, uh, which are also released from the plasma membrane, but are remnants from, from dying cells. EVs are pretty similar to the cells that they stem from, um, in that they consist of a, a double lipid uh, 
uh, by a membrane which contains um, different uh, proteins inside of this membrane, again, resembling that of the parent cells, and then also intravesicular contents such as DNA, RNA, transcription factors, and also other proteins, which again also resemble uh, the cells that they stem from. And as such, EVs have been uh, considered as um, yeah, interesting biomarkers and also functional conveyors of information in health and disease. Uh, furthermore, EVs uh, are at least seen by many as um, a good source of biopsies of single cells that are readily available in biological fluids. Um, however, as most of you probably know, EVs are pretty difficult um, to purify and, um, and look at uh, um, because there are many other different particles in the biological nanoparticle landscape that might look like them. Uh, some examples are in this figure here. Um, and um, as we can see here, we've got different lipoproteins. We've got HDL, LDL, uh, BLDL, and color microns, uh, all of which are very abundant in blood plasma, for example. And uh, we've also got some protein aggregates. Uh, and then another interesting thing we have to look at is that um, lipoproteins uh, vastly outnumber EVs. So if we try to purify EVs based on their physical features, such as size, we might actually capture BLDL and chylomicrons and perhaps even some LDLs. Uh, if we purify EVs based on their density, we might actually capture HDLs and LDLs as well. This is one of the reasons why a lot of clinical studies have uh, looked at flow cytometry uh, for characterization of EVs, as it is thought that uh, by labeling EVs with specific, uh, or labels against specific markers, we might um, overcome some of these issues with uh, lipoproteins overshadowing uh, the EV populations we're interested in. Uh, however, one can ask oneself, uh, are lipoprotein, are lipoproteins actual, actually potential contaminants in those cytometry studies? From our studies, at least, we could see that um, uh, phosphatidylserine markers such as NXN5 and lactadherin are, uh, that are commonly employed in clinical flow cytometry studies um, to define EVs uh, might actually correlate a lot with triglycerides, um, which are associated with uh, lipoproteins, especially VLDL and uh, chylomicrons. Furthermore, we have also seen that spiking or removal of lipoproteins from uh, platelet poor plasma has resulted in increase uh, and decreased uh, PS bearing EVs detected by flow cytometry, respectively. Uh, so, when we look at the surface composition of EVs and uh, at least the larger lipoproteins, such as VLDL and chylomicrons, we can actually see that they are very similar to each other in that they are uh, all covered in phospholipids of which uh, phosphatidylserine uh, is present on both EVs and lipoproteins. Uh, furthermore, uh, or based on this, we can uh, hypothesize that, um, that, it, that it is possible that PS labels such as NXN5 and lactoterin might stain lipoproteins. Uh, and this might also explain some of the correlations we've seen with, with uh, P, uh, between PS and, uh, and yeah, lipoproteins in general in our clinical studies. Or with this study, we aim to first uh, optimize the staining protocol for large APOV containing lipoproteins, um, as these are probably uh, the ones we'd be detecting on uh, most flow cytometers. That those would be BLDLs and chylomicrons with sizes. Uh, above 100 nanometers at least. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, we wanted to evaluate um, to which degree common uh, PS labels, uh, NXN5 and lactoterin might stain lipoproteins in blood plasma. And then finally, uh, again, because uh, both EVs and lipoproteins are lipophilic in nature, we wanted to look at whether detergent lysis uh, might also affect uh, lipoproteins and especially those um, that are positive for the expression of PS markers, uh, as, as this might uh, limit the potential for this control to, to exclude um, non-EV events. Um, so to start out, um, we did a lot of work in optimizing uh, fluorescent antibody staining of lipoproteins. So to stain these lipoproteins, um, 
we used a P conjugated goat polyclonal anti FB, uh, and we analyzed our samples on an FG uh, A60 micro flow cytometer. And the triggering strategy we used um, could detect um, silica beads down to below 100 nanometers in size. That would uh, pretty much include VLDLs, or at least, least the larger VLDLs, and also chyla microns um, regarding lipoproteins, uh, as well as uh, a fair amount of EVs. The reason why we used polyclonal anti FB was um, simply because um, uh, VLDL and chylomicron, and also uh, LDL for that matter, only carry one single copy of the FB molecule on the surface. So to get sufficient labeling uh, of, uh, of these particles, um, we needed to label multiple antigens on this single molecule. And to do that, we used polyclonal antibodies. Furthermore, to make sure that we were actually looking at uh, single lipoprotein events um, or actual lipoprotein events, we included a lot of, we included a lot of different controls. Among these, uh, we of course did careful titration of our reagents to prevent non-specific binding of them to, the, uh, to other entities in our sample that we were not interested in uh, labeling. Uh, we also used commercial VLDL and chylomicrons as uh, positive controls for our labeling. We did post-stain dilution controls to control for uh, coincident event detection on the flow cytometer. We did isotype and unstained uh, controls to control for non-specific binding and also autofluorescence in the samples. We, uh, we had buffer with reagent controls to look at uh, fluorescent uh, aggregates of our reagents. And then finally, we did ERF or equivalent reference fluorophore standardization of our FB fluorescence to get a rough estimate of how many um, FB antibodies were actually bound to the surface of, of each of the lipoproteins we, we detected. Looking at the results, we, we could see that we could label distinct FB positive uh, populations in all of our samples. So when we look at our um, uh, positive controls, the commercial VLDL stain sample, we actually got a very nice population um, there, which was not present in any of the other controls we had. Uh, the same for our commercial chylomicrons, we got a very nice population there. Um, and then again, not much in the other uh, controls. And then also the same for frozen uh, blood plasma we were pretty sure that we were actually looking at single lipoproteins because um, the size ranges uh, that we uh, of the FB positive particles that we detected uh, corresponded to that of chylomicrons and also the largest VLDL particles. We didn't see any significant correlation between light scatter and uh, fluorescence intensities, uh, meaning that we probably don't have aggregation caused by the antibodies. Also, the total event concentrations and light scattered distributions were similar between the stained samples and the controls. That would be the isotype control and the unstained controls. And then finally, um, our serial dilutions of the stained samples also suggested that we had no or at, at the very most very little coparticle detection of lipoproteins uh, in blood plasma. So moving on from this, uh, we move to the second aim of the study, and that was to investigate whether phosphatidyl serin labels uh, such as annexin 5 or lactoterin can stain lipoproteins in blood plasma. So to do this, we actually added yeah, either annexin 5, lactoterin, or uh, CD41 to our samples that were stained with APOB uh, in frozen blood plasma. And when we looked at the annexin 5 uh, population, about 43% uh, of our total annexin-5 um, particles were actually positive for APOB as well. Uh, so we can actually see a very nice population here, uh, or very nice if, if, you're, if you like seeing um, annexin-5 labeled lipoproteins, which was not present in its isotype control, for example. We saw very few lactoherin positive, uh, APOB positive events, um, only 2.8%, and also very few uh, CD41 positive events. And CD41 was our EV membrane control, which should be fairly specific towards um, EVs and not um, really be present on the surface of any of the lipoproteins. 
However, we were not exactly satisfied with uh, with these results, um, as there might be some freezing or thawing artifacts that cause aggregation of uh, of different indices and particles uh, in our samples. So we repeated the exact same experiment, this time with a fresh blood plasma from three healthy individuals. And with the fresh blood plasma, we actually replicated these results, um, albeit a bit less dramatic for NXN5, uh, where now only 19.6% were double positive for NXN5 and upper B. For lactoterin, uh, the percentage went a bit up to about 5.3%. And then finally for CD41, it was pretty low at 2.3%. So based on this, uh, we could conclude that um, both lactoterin uh, and annexin 5 actually uh, stain uh, APOB positive particles uh, or, or lipoproteins. Um, however, they do so to a vastly different uh, extent. Uh, one of the reasons um, for this is that um, lactoterin um, has some preference towards binding to double layer lipid membranes uh, and its affinity towards phosphatidylserine is nearly diminished completely when it is presented to phosphatidylserine on a single lip, uh, phospholipid membrane. However, we do still see uh, some lactoterin uh, binding to um, lipoproteins. Now that we demonstrated that uh, phosphatidylserine labels might stain uh, lipoproteins in blood plasma, uh, we wanted to, to look at uh, whether these are also lysed when we add detergent to control for EB specificity. Because uh, if these particles are not lysed, well, we can at least account for them. Uh, so uh, in order to verify that the addition of detergent actually worked and lysed EVs, EVs at least, um, we looked at uh, CD41 positive events. And here we could see that, we, that there was a significant reduction of the CD41 positive events after we added detergent to the stain samples. However, uh, this was also true for the annexin 5 and lactoterin, the positive lipoprotein events, um, which were reduced uh, also fairly dramatically. Um, and this again is due to probably like, uh, or likely due to the lysis of lipoproteins as well as EVs, um, which again owes to their li lipophilic na nature. So uh, in conclusion, um, we demonstrated that we could detect single APOB positive lipoproteins in blood plasma both an XN5 uh, and lactoterin labeled uh, phosphatidylserine on the surface of lipoproteins. However, this was significantly more pronounced for an XN5 than for lactoterin. And then finally, detergent lysis of stain samples also result in a reduction of an XN5 and uh, lactoterin lipoprotein events. Uh, and if we end, um, or we can end this uh, presentation looking at uh, the final figure we included in the paper, uh, and again, emphasizing that lipoproteins and EVs resemble each other very much on the surface. Uh, however, if we are to actually overcome some of uh, the labeling issues, we can look more closely at the membrane stru structure. So lipo uh, lipoproteins have a single um, phospholipid layer on the surface, um, which does not really allow incorporation of uh, transmembrane proteins such as uh, tetraspanins or other uh, transport proteins that are present in cells. And by using uh, tetraspanins or transport proteins that, uh, that are transmembrane in nature, we can, uh, we can fairly much or, or probably uh, limit the amount of lipoproteins that confound on uh, our data to a fair extent. And with that, uh, I would like to end by acknowledging, yeah, first of all, my co-authors, Osa and Jens, for all of their contributions to the study and also to the, to the paper. And then also to Rege, who collected um, um, most of the samples for this study, Katrine for, uh, for, for helping um, perform uh, NTA analysis of uh, lipoproteins. And then finally, also Joshua, uh, for reading an early version of the manuscript and providing good feedback uh, that definitely improved the quality of, of our work. And then finally also, uh, yeah, Toyota Fund in Denmark for providing funding for this study. And with that, I would also like to thank you for your attention.
Well, thank you very much, Yako, and thanks to those who have put questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. um, so please keep the questions coming in. Uh, we're not going to take a pause right now, but we will get to all of the questions after our next presentation, which is from Sara Brusato. And I know that Joy Wolfram is also here. So Joy, feel free to, to, uh, to jump in if you would like to say anything as well. Um, but Sara, please go ahead. And I see you're sharing your screen already. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit more about these uh, considerations that you've written about. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome everybody to the second part of this uh, uh, joint EV club. My name is Sarah, and today I'm going to present our recently published uh, commentary paper published on Journal of Extracellular Vesicles entitled Considerations for Extracellular Vesicles and Lipoproteins Interaction in Cell Culture um, Essay. I know that usually the acknowledgement slides goes last in, the, in usual presentations, but this time I would like to um, change the order of things and acknowledge first the uh, work and contribution of uh, other people that made this uh, work and today's presentation possible. I started working on this project when I was a postdoctoral fellow in the nanote nanotechnology and extracellular vesicle lab headed by Dr. Joy Wolfram at Mayo Clinic, Florida. And when I left the uh, uh, Wolfram lab in May, 2020, two of my former colleagues, the uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Yubo Yang, and uh, the at the time graduate student, Dr. Dalila Yanotta, continued working on the project. And in fact, they are co-first um, author with me on this uh, publication. This work was also possible thanks to the collaboration with Professor Talmon and Dr. Davidovich from the Technion Institute in, uh, in Israel. They provided uh, some um, uh, fundamental cryotium images and images analysis, and I will discuss them later. Uh, since June 2020, I joined the Moses Lab at Boston Children Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, current lab and my current PI, um, Dr. Uh, Marsha Moses, and thank her for, a continue, for her continued support and uh, mentorship. Here at least a uh, list of uh, funding sources that made our um, work possible. Today I'm going to talk about extracellular vesicles and lipoproteins interaction in vitro. And uh, I know that the audience today is probably more expert than me on the extracellular vesicle topic. So I won't spend much time describing again, extracellular vesicles, their structure and function and possible application. But I would just like to reiterate one more time that the extracellular vesicle are just one of the um, many type of nanoparticles, biological nanoparticles that we can find in biological fluids. And in a paper published in collaboration with my um, PhD advisor and mentor, Professor Paolo Vergese, we define this, uh, um, all the secret nanoparticles as the nanostructure secretome. In the EV field, other than um, extracellular vesicle, we are used to hear about lipoproteins. In fact, they are both heterogeneous subclasses of cell secreted nanoparticles that shares uh, an overlap in, uh, um, in size and density. Therefore, uh, it's not unusual to um, if we attempt, uh, if we want to isolate or concentrate extracellular vesicles to also have some uh, um, lipoprotein contamination. In fact, here you can see some uh, uh, cryo-TM images of uh, samples where extracellular vesicles were co-isolated with some um, lipoproteins. And if the opinion that the extracellular vesicle community and experts have on the presence of lipoproteins in the final final extracellular vesicle formulation is very clear and it is that usually we don't want lipoproteins and we consider them to be um, extracellular vesicle contaminants. The position is um, not that clear if we think about in vitro assays studying extracellular vesicles and their interplay with target cells. 
Let me briefly summarize what usually it's the goal of an in vitro study. Well, the in vitro studies attempts to recapitulate what is the in vivo environment, replicating many parameters like humidity, temperature, pH, and also uh, media composition. In fact, uh, oftentimes we supplement the media with serum or serum derived um, components that provide critical components, uh, biomolecules and biological nanoparticles typical of the interstitial fluid and that also guarantee the viability and function of the um, of the target cells that we have in culture. If we look at the in the EV literature, though, we can uh, we can find different type of in vitro studies uh, using extracellular vesicles that use different condition. For example, we can find um, in vitro study using studying EVs in serum free uh, media condition. Um, about the serum free media condition, we know that um, they entail the total absence of protein or biological nanoparticles, which uh, from decades of experiments with synthetic nanoparticles, especially lipid-based nanoparticles, we know that, that those proteins and biological nanoparticles are fundamental, for example, to determine the protein corona of um, synthetic and lipid-based nanoparticles. So we don't know if the serum-free condition may also impact the extracellular vesicle corona with so far uh, poorly known consequences. Uh, another condition, in vitro condition, that is um, usually uh, used in some of the papers published in the EV literature is uh, um, a media that is supplemented with serum that has been previously depleted of uh, endogenous extracellular vesicles. Usually, um, EV depleted serum is obtained by ultracentrifugation, a long ultracentrifugation step, especially if made in the house, or um, if uh, purchased from, uh, from companies, if commercially available, usually is obtained after um, a polymer-based precipitation protocol. Analyzing the um, lipoprotein content of uh, some uh, commercially available EV depleted FBS, we could um, in fact see that other than a, a significant TV depletion, they also depleted the uh, lipoprotein population. In particular, we detected a 93% reduction in LDL and VLDL and a 19% reduction in HDL. We have to take into consideration, though, that in, uh, um, in circulation, in physiological condition, the circulating lipoproteins are six orders of magnitude more abundant than EVs. Therefore, studying the um, EVs um, function um, and interplay with target cells in the total absence of lipoproteins or in a lipoproteins depleted environment, it may not mirror um, faithfully what is going on um, in vivo. So uh, we have to be very careful in the comparison of in vitro studies in, based on the um, supplements that they used in the uh, cell culture media. In the past decades, we had um, many, uh, we have many uh, published paper that have advanced evidences and preliminary data supporting the fact that extracellular vesicles and lipoproteins interact. Specifically, extracellular vesicles seems to interact with um, low-density lipoproteins. The first, one of the first paper advancing this, um, this hypothesis, this evidence, is that was published by Soder et al. in 2016, and another paper was published by um, um, me as a, as a first author when I was working as a postdoctoral fellow in the Wolfram lab. We published some preliminary data suggesting that extracellular vesicles and LDL uh, interact and that this interaction changes based on the uh, EV source and on the target cells. Um, here a quick um, reminder of the published results. So here you can see some uh, extracellular vesicles derived from triple negative breast cancer cells, MDA, MB231. If mixed with LDL, they do not form visible aggregates. However, um, the brain-seeking variants of the MDA, MB231 cells called BRM2831 uh, derived EVs, if mixed with LDL, 
they form visible micron-sized aggregates, uh, clearly visible under um, atomic force microscopy. Uh, here, a cross-section of the samples that makes you appreciate the increased thickness of the aggregates formed by the brain-seeking EVs incubated with LDL. Um, the interaction, of course, uh, changes also based on the target cells, as we said. Here, a quick, um, a quick example. If extracellular vesicles alone derived by both MDA and B231 cells and the brain seeking cells are incubated with HBMEC, we see um, a, an uptake pattern that is completely different if the EVs are incubated with LDL. We, in fact, we see a significant decrease in endothelial cell uptake. The situation is different if we change the target cells and if we take, for example, a cancer monocyte, THP1 cells, and if we um, incubate the uh, brain-seeking EVs with the LDL and then we um, put them in the in in this, with this, the, the THP1 cells in culture, we can detect a significantly increased uh, cell uptake. For the purpose of uh, this commentary, we further um, study uh, the um, uptake of cancer-derived EVs from um, cancer monocytes, the THP1 cells, um, EVs alone and uh, uh, mixed with the low density lipoproteins. And in three out of four tested group, uh, if the EVs were, were um, pre-mixed with the low density lipoproteins, the um, uptake for, from the uh, target uh, cells, the cancer monocyte was significantly um, increased. Um, the presence of physiological level of uh, low density uh, lipopro lipoproteins also dramatically changed the um, cancer derived EVs induced effect on our recipient cells, the THP1 monocytes. In fact, uh, the THP1 monocyte just stimulated with cancer derived EVs uh, shows an increased um, messenger RNA level of tumor necrosis factor alpha. If the LD DL are mixed with uh, the cancer-derived EVs. Instead, the messenger RNA level of uh, tumosis necrosis factor alpha are significantly um, decreased. Um, as we uh, we know, um, it's there is um, a whole piece of literature supporting the fact that um, both um, EVs oxidize LDL and also um, immune cells play key role in the, um, in the cancer pathogenesis. So there may be a lot of speculation that can be done on this very preliminary data and that needs to be further confirmed with more um, experiments. But the real point that we want to, to raise from uh, this uh, in vitro data is that whether we use uh, only a V-depleted medium or a V-depleted medium supplemented with LDL, we obtain conflicting uh, results. So, um, so far, I hope that I uh, convinced you that if we use EV alone or EV um, extracellular vesicle mixed with low density lipoproteins in vitro, we obtain conflicting results. However, um, the um, the fact whether um, there is still a big open question and is whether the, these extracellular vesicles and low density lipoproteins interact also um, in vivo, in, uh, in physiological condition. There are uh, published papers. Uh, one of them was published in 2020 by Paul Vianian, I hope that I said that correctly, um, and colleagues. Um, showing that uh, the, um, uh, the proteomic profiling of extracellular vesicles derived from blood, both serum and plasma, um, has uh, shown the presence of apolipoproteins, which are the protein constituent of um, lipoproteins in circulation. However, being um, a proteomic analysis, they show the presence of the apolipoproteins, but not of the um, of the whole nanoparticle. So it's still uh, unknown whether this binding or fusion occurs also um, in an in vivo environment. In order to um, make a step further into this, uh, um, into this topic and try to um, 
answer um, a little bit more to the to this uh, to these questions, we took some uh, cryo TM images of crude human plasma, and we observed um, many. Um, in, in many cases, most, more than 50% of the, of, the, of the cases, the um, nanoparticles, the limited by lipid bilayer, here uh, indicated by black arrows that we refer to as extracellular vesicles, happen to be fused or bound to other uh, nanoparticles that by size, uh, morphology, and uh, um, and um, crystalline phase, uh, we, think we identified at, as a lipoprotein-like structure um, indicated by white arrow. Then um, better analyzing the, the morphology and the size, well, by size, if um, um, they, they, um, there, might be, there may be uh, VLDL or kilomicrons, and uh, um, we uh, support the fact that these are lipoprotein-like structure and not protein aggregates, because they, um, they present a, a polyhedral uh, structure with the uh, um, uh, with uh, a crystalline phase with straight facets, which is typical of uh, um, particles with lipid hydrocarbon chains, that's supporting the fact that are lipoproteins and not um, protein aggregates. So as a future direction, we would like to um, uh, suggest to consider the role of uh, serum components in uh, uh, the extracellular vesicles in vitro studies, and to consider these uh, uh, components also based on the source of, uh, um, of the serum or serum-derived supplements. Um, although we suggest to um, keep using um, serum-free or EV lipoprotein-reduced media during the EV isolation, we would also like to um, uh, to suggest uh, to limit the use of this uh, serum-free or EV lipoprotein uh, um, depleted condition for in vitro experiments using extracellular vesicles, as the results that you obtain may be less reflective of uh, in vivo settings. Um, we would also like to uh, shed the light uh, once more on the interaction uh, between uh, nanoparticles. Today, we focused on the interaction between extracellular vesicles and lipoprotein, specifically low density lipoproteins. But as we um, mentioned today, uh, there are many uh, biological nanoparticles in um, depending on the biological fluids, and we don't exclude that there may be other um, interaction with the extracellular vesicles. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation. I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much also for um, uh, to Dr. Wolfram for allowing me to, to present today uh, our, our work. And thank you very much uh, to uh, Dr. Whitworth for the um, uh, invitation. And I'm happy to take any question. Well, thank you, Sarah, for your presentation, and thank you also, Yako. So we're going to start out with a question from Massimiliano Rushika. Massimiliano, could you please um, ask your question? Okay. Um, nice presentation, and uh, compliments for all the data showed. Uh, for curiosity, uh, chylomicrons have ApoB48 and VLDL have uh, carry ApoB100. So are you able to distinguish about these two ApoB or not? So it's just a curiosity if you commented on, uh, on it. So are similar or not? Uh, so I suppose this is a question for me. Um, so distinguishing between ApoB48 and ApoB100 is pretty difficult. Um, the antibody that we used uh, was not specific to either of them. So, so we could not really distinguish between the two. Regarding uh, relative fluorescence levels, uh, or median fluorescence levels at least, we did not see any difference between the chylomic or any significant difference between the chylomicron samples and the VLDL samples that were commercial commercially uh, procured. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So I think it was just a curiosity also because when uh, VLDL are uh, transformed in LDL and they carry also 
ApoB100. So in, in your data uh, relative to VLDL, since you spoke about larger or uh, uh, larger VLDL, you are referred to VLDL type one, if I'm not wrong. So maybe in, in your data with VLDL, maybe you can have a contamination, not a contamination, but the, it, you can detect also LDL, the, the contribution of, a, of LDL, or are you able to distinguish between VLDL and LDL? I doubt very much that we would be able to see LDL uh, on a flow cytometer because um, it is just not that sensitive. Um, however, we did, we did have to uh, dilute our samples, uh, especially the plasma samples, uh, significantly before we stained to actually get a proper staining of, uh, of these particles. Um, and by our calculations, if we also account for uh, LDL and the APOB100 uh, associated with that, we'd get about 10 to 15 antibodies bound to uh, each APOB molecule. However, um, there might be some stichiometric uh, difficulties, um, especially on the smaller LDLs, making it unlikely to have that many antibodies bound on the surface, whereas uh, BLDL and chylomicrons might allow for binding of more, and especially the larger BLDL and chy chylomicrons, meaning that, um, yeah, it might be possible to actually see the median uh, fluorescence uh, or ERF values of about 120 to 150, as we saw in our uh, study at least. Thank you very much indeed for your answers and uh, my compliments for your paper and uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, our next questions, I believe, are also for Jaco from Edwin, Edwin Vanderpool. All right, uh, that's really true. Uh, yeah, I wondered. Um, so lysis depends on uh, the detergent. So, so which detergent did you use? Um, and I also wondered what the state of the donors uh, was. What, were they fasting or uh, did they eat before? Because from our own experience, I know that also matters a lot. Yes, uh, those are actually very good questions. So we just used uh, Triton X100 uh, uh, at a final concentration of about 1%, at least in most of our uh, clinical studies, this this has been sufficient to lyse most EVs. Uh, however, some EVs, especially CD9 positive EVs, um, tend to be a bit more resistant towards Triton X100. Um, regarding the donors, they were actually all uh, fasting at least overnight for at least eight hours. Um, but even so, uh, there would probably still be some chylomicrons uh, in the system, probably enough to even outnumber the EVs, uh, considering that chylomicrons um, are present uh, at several orders of magnitude uh, more than EVs. I actually should have predicted that you were uh, measuring fasting donors because, uh, uh, yeah, the numbers you find are actually uh, roughly what we also find uh, with a different measurement method, but also for fasting donors. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It's always here to. It's always a uh, very nice to to hear some corroboration, right? Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah, Thanks especially with with different methods. It's really yes, indeed, yeah. indeed. Uh, let's go next to uh, Fabrice Lucien. Fabrice. Hello. Yes. Um, yeah. So my question is maybe more for Jaco, but I'm sure Sarah can also chip in since. Uh, based on, on what she presented. But yeah, I mean, we also found some sometimes some double staining when we use APOB and CD61. But one of the questions that I have is, you know, recently has been published in Journal of Extra Vesicles that they can have some APOB, APO lipoprotein, uh, APOB uh, present on the surface of the EVs like in, in the protein corona. So, I mean, I mean, I don't necessarily have the answers, but um, how can we not exclude that the detection of APOB uh, is not only lipoproteins, but also some, you know, soluble protein present on the surface of the EEs. This is a question that I kind of expected uh, to be asked. Um, <laughs> and uh, I kind of don't have a very good answer for it, other than that we didn't see a lot of um, CD41 APOB uh, co-staining. Uh, so from the numbers that I presented, it was, uh, I think, about 2.3% uh, in fresh fasting donors, meaning that most APOB is uh, probably exclusive to 
lipoproteins, or at least not platelet vesicles. Uh, and most CD41 do, or, or positive EVs do not carry APOB on the surface. Um, but we'd probably uh, see different numbers if we used CD9, for example, C63 or CD9, uh, uh, C81, um, because those uh, markers would probably um, account for a larger population of, of EVs present in blood. Um, but yeah, other than that, I can't really say that FOB is not part of the corona. Thanks, Fabrice. Our next question is from Louis Vu, um, who does not have the microphone working. So uh, this is a question for Yako. Could you please elaborate more on why you used CD41 um, as a platelet marker? Would you, uh, since it is a platelet marker, would you would you perhaps see more events if you used um, one or more of the tetraspanins? So the reason why we use CD41 is because we've done a lot of research with platelets uh, or platelet derived EVs. Uh, at least. Um, so this is a marker that we trust. Uh, it's a marker that works 100% of the time. And that was basically the rationale for using it. Uh, regarding the tetraspans, um, we've actually not had that much luck with CD63 or CD81, um, uh, at least in blood plasma. CD9 is a pretty good marker. And we would probably have found more EVs by using CD9. But but, but yeah, maybe not we, for 63 and 81, you're suggesting? No, uh, at least not uh, the clones that we tested. Mm -hmm. Very good. Next question, we move to Patricia Ozawa. Pat Patricia. Hi, uh, so my question is for Jakob too. I was just wondering if you checked for EV contamination on your commercially isolated lipoprotein, because we all know it's hard to just isolate EVs and the same way, uh, the same other way around. So just wondering. The short answer is no, we did not check um, our commercially isolated lipoproteins for EV contamination. Uh, and the reason for this was uh, that, um, that we basically only used them as positive controls for our FOB staining. All of the, uh, uh, all of the work done with uh, lactoterin and XN5 and also detergent lysis was done in uh, in uh, platelet poor blood plasma, both frozen and fresh from fasting donors. So that, that's why we didn't really find it necessary to check for EV contamination in our commercially isolated lipoproteins. Can I add yeah, a I comment on Go ahead. this? Because actually I did check for EV contaminations on LDL, commercially available LDL samples, not for this commentary, but for previous experiments. Uh, was a lit, uh, we did an um, ELISA assay for CD63. So in that sense, the EV search was a little bit biased because we, we just look for one of the many EV marker out there, as we know, although it's quite um, represented. But um, the signal for the commercially available LDL sample sample was absent or negligible at the very best. Yeah, so no EV contaminants apparently. Sorry, you probably don't know this, but we recently checked them through CryoTM, the commercial LDL, and we did see some EVs present um, through the lipid bilayer in the commercial LDL samples. Yeah, Joy, I, I have to say that we have seen the same thing. Um, and I, I like to, sh I have a nice EM that I show, not not cryo, unfortunately, but a regular EM, a regular TEM. And um, and we do see that contamination in commercial preps of LDL. Uh, we've also checked by ExoView. So just taking the LDL um, or other lipoprotein preparation and putting it onto an ExoView chip uh, for SP iris. And we see some some markers there as well. So um, so it's it's there, I, and and you know I think that in in the EM that that I'm thinking about, you know you see a lot of LDL, and they're so nice and uniform. But it, within that field, there's still one somewhere between one and three EV particles that are that are adopting the normal EV morphology. Um, so given that they're um, usually somewhat larger than the LDL, they they actually do present a a good portion of the volume of material that's there. I'd also like to quickly add. A small comment. Um, so I would expect some EV contamination uh, in LDL preparations, but considering that most um, lipoproteins are isolated by density uh, gradient centrifugations, uh, the EV contamination of VLDL and chylomicron 
preparations would probably be fairly minimal, uh, mostly for, or at least for chylomicrons, as these are much uh, less dense than EVs. Yeah, indeed, and, and indeed, they can be even slightly less dense than water. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's a good point. And in fact, our next question is going to be about isolation and separation methods. So, um, Michael Skliar, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. So my, my question <clears throat> was triggered by uh, um, Cray TM that Sarah showed, uh, where we saw those uh, complexes of EVs and uh, LDLs. Uh, but but of course, like you know, Jacob is is welcome to comment as well. Um, so when I see a complex like this, what I immediately think is that it will take some attractive forces for that to happen because. Uh, you know, EVs are stabilized by their corona, so there is this steric forces that keep them apart. So, so, so as, as a result, but, but at the same time, if you overcome the sort of barrier, you know, they, they obviously, you know, sort of, for the lack of a better term, wet each other because they're, they're, they're lipids. Uh, and, and we did see that in images. So I was wondering if you look at isolation techniques like ultra centrifugation, where there's a lot of forces to bring all this content together, you wouldn't see the prevalence of these complexes more often than if you looked at different isolation techniques. Thank you. And thank you both by, for, for interesting talks. So about the cryo-TM images that I showed as one of, in one of the last slide, that was um, a crude plasma um, just deposited and an image. Uh, by cryo-TM, so there was not um, a significant processing of the sample. Um, I don't know, I, I, I totally changed uh, the field of study since uh, June 2020, and I'm not studying the EV interaction with LDL or any type of lipoproteins now, but I know that Dr. Wolfram um, is, is still uh, looking in this uh, in this uh, topic. So probably um, she can, uh, she, she, I don't know if she, she, does, she did some uh, more cryo TM images on EVs isolated with, uh, with different type of, uh, of isolation process. But for that specific image that was just a uh, crude human plasma deposited and, and imaged. So no, um, no ultra centrifugation or not, not a heavy processing of the sample. But um, in terms of published literature, um, there are many papers that show the presence of apolipoproteins. So again, just the, the protein components of the lipoproteins as part of the EV uh, protein corona on different type of EVs formulation isolated through by different methods. So you see density gradient, size exclusion chromatography and the combination of this. So um, apparently, um, independently from the, the isolation method, we can find at least protein components of the lipoprotein as the, the EV corona. Great question. Um, I also like this next question from Kerstin Stemmer. Hey there. So first of all, thank you both for very inspiring talks. I have a question to Sarah. And Honestly, I, I do think that the interaction between the EVs and the lipoprotein seems meaningful, especially if you look in the in vivo system, because from the pharmacological point of view, that is a system that also keeps drugs in the circulation. So, so the binding to the lipoproteins and also to albumin. So would the lipoprotein EV binding prolong the plasma half-life of EVs, protect them from being uptaken by other cells and tissues, or uh, even change their organ distribution by more interacting with organs that express the LDL receptor or any other lipoprotein receptor? So um, my uh, answer will be um, based on speculation because I, I, never, um, I never tested the EV or EV and lipoproteins in vivo. I know that there are many different uh, interesting in vivo model that may um, advance this, this, this type of studies based uh, on the 
um, on the presence or absence of lipoprotein receptor or lipoprotein themselves. But um, so I, I do think, I do agree that the binding between EVs and lipoproteins may play a role in the biodistribution of the extracellular vesicles and in the extracellular vesicle uptake and also in the immune system activation. As we know from um, decades of studies with synthetic uh, nanoparticles, the protein corona determined the, um, the biological identity of the nanoparticles. So why it, is, it shouldn't be the same for also biological nanoparticles and in this case, extracellular vesicles. So I agree. I agree that, that, would be, it, it, that, that could be the case and that's an interesting topic, yeah. topic that needs further uh, studies. Yeah, thanks a lot. And it could be also therape uh, therapeutically meaningful if it comes to the use of EVs in vivo. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Any any comments from you, Jaco, on that point? Uh, not really. Uh, I've not really thought about, uh, or I've not done much work on EVs as uh, therapeutical agents, but I do find it uh, to be a bit interesting, especially regarding the protective nature of, or, or even the targeting nature of having LDL or albumin or other proteins bound to the surface of EVs. Indeed. Definitely so an interesting question. And, and we have another comment here in the in the chat box too, which I'm just going to read in the interest of time here, but it's from FC Van Megan. Um, and uh, this person asked, do you feel the interaction can be contrib uh, attributed to receptor interactions between proteins in the corona and lipoprotein? So I think that's a big, that's a big question that we have now, right? I mean, is it, is it, you know, it, what is it? Is it something that's intrinsic to the EV that is a transmembrane protein that's medi mediating these interactions, or is it something else, something that might be more loosely associated? And I don't think we have the answer to that yet. No, but uh, one thing that I would like to, ha to add to this comment is that other than uh, um, uh, receptor interaction, we also noticed that cancer-derived EVs and the different type of cancer-derived EVs have different uh, lipid phase composition of their membrane. Mm. And those also may play a role in the interaction with the lipid-based nanoparticles as lipoproteins are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, you know, depending on exactly what the molecules are that are involved, those interactions are gonna be closer and, and tighter, I guess you could say, or they might be a little bit more, more loose. Um, so, so lots of, I can, I can almost hear everybody, you know, taking notes here from, from all these great questions and the responses. Um, I think there's a lot to discover here, both at the basic biology level, but then also, you know, about what we can do with EVs therapeutically, um, with their biodistribution and their targeting. So, so I'd like to conclude here. Um, thank, thank, um, thank you all for coming in today and for, for, for listening to these great talks and, and contributing the questions. Um, but a special, a special thanks to uh, Sara and Yako and their groups. Um, so congratulations on these two very interesting papers. Um, and we want to wish you the best as you continue your work. So thank you, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. And uh, take care. Bye now.